Don't be deceived by the narratives they propagate about Africa being primitive. We had vast African kingdoms from Benin to Igala, Mali to the great Zimbabwe, Kush to ancient Egypt. We were constructing magnificent architecture, smelting iron, mining gold and developing roads long before the British knew how to build them. It's called the Wall of Benin, it's like one of the world's largest structures, but I've never known about it. And it was in Nigeria. It was the capital city, but they made interconnecting walls that stretched over 10,000 miles. And it was all man-made and it was like one, the world's largest structure. But the British destroyed it in 1897 wow. when they were colonizing it. Lame. But that's enough wall to circle the United States three times. It says four times longer than the Great Wall of China. How have I never heard of that? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Even the people of Nigeria now, they don't even know about it. So like people are trying to like discover more about it to teach them of their ancient culture and stuff. It they started in 800 AD and continued okay. until 1460 AD. Yeah, they said it took 150 million man hours to build. Very Miles little on. remains today. How is that possible? Because the British destroyed it. All of it. Imperialism. Yeah. Is that not insane? That's crazy. Yeah. Never heard of it before. Europeans have dominated the planet for merely 600 years. Put it in perspective, there were 200,000 years of African dominance before that. We should be studying black people from 10,000 years ago. But teachers will say, well, that's prehistorical. That is the truth. We need to teach the truth. The first black people who came here were not brought here as slaves. They came here as discoverers and explorers between 20,000 and 10,000 years before Columbus was born. Christopher Columbus actually wrote in the Journal of the Second Voyage that when he was in Haiti, Native Americans came to them and told them that black-skinned people had come in large boats trading in gold-tipped metal spears. Columbus took two of these spears and sent them back to Spain to be assayed. They were microscopically inspected in Spain. And then they found that of 32 parts, 18 were gold, 6 of silver, and 8 of copper. That's identical with spears being forged in African Guinea. And all the songs, the songs that the, Af the Native Americans were using for these spears are the same songs that the Africans were using, Ghana and Kane and Kani and Ghanin, etc. The Americans had added one word, Ghanini, the gold merchants, which mm -hmm. referred to the Africans bringing in these things. And then I found Ferdinand Columbus wrote a book in his father. He said, my father told me he saw Negroes north of Honduras. And then I found that Vasco Nunez de Balboa in September 2015, year 1513, coming down the slopes of Quarcoa, which is in Darien, which we now call Panama, actually saw two tall black men among the Native Americans. The Spanish were startled. These men were about a foot and a half taller than the Native American. They were exceedingly black. They had a different texture of hair, different features. Africa is the home of the world's most ancient civilizations. Far too often, Africa has been thought of as isolated and static, but nothing could be further from the truth. The roots of every family tree trace here to Africa. And so does the history of civilization. In this series, we'll be going on a journey through 200,000 years of history. We'll explore great cities built along Africa's extensive trade networks, discover art of unparalleled beauty and technical brilliance, and marvel at thousands of years of breathtaking architecture. What struck me watching this is that you use words like merchants and trade and engineering. It seemed like you were really trying to stress the achievements here. Mm -hmm. Why do you think those achievements have been obscured? I think the achievements of Africans have been obscured, first of all, because of slavery. Um, 12.5 million Africans were shipped across the Atlantic Ocean between the 16th century and the 19th century. 12.5 million Africans shipped to enslavement in the New World. And then, after 1884, which was the conference in Berlin, when European powers sat down, looked at an empty map of Africa and basically carved it up like you carve up a pizza pie. And they go, you're Spain, what do you want? Uh, you're Italy, what do you want? You're England, what do you want? You're King Leopold, he personally got the Congo. So they had to create a fiction of Africa as an empty place or a static place full of primitive people who were stuck in time. And those were ostensibly our ancestors. But the pre-colonial world 
knew all about Africa. There wasn't a moment really since the ancient Egyptians when Northern Africa, the Mediterranean world, and the larger world was not in touch with African civilizations, but some part of Africa. The Red Sea was a highway. The Nile was a highway. The Sahara was a highway, particularly after the domestication of camels. And the Indian Ocean highways. The emperor of, of Great Zimbabwe ate off porcelain plates that came from China. That's the 13th century. I mean, it's incredible. Most of Europe's gold between 1000 AD and 1500 AD came from West Africa. All of our history was stolen from us. We were robbed of the history because Europeans wanted to justify an economic order which depended upon our ancestors' exploitation. Unbelievable multi-hundred years history of anti-black racism in the United States and you know around the world, certainly in Europe, has a big impact because I think uh, you know African descended people have been so othered and so demonized that there is a, a lack of interest in Africa as a continent. It's seen as a place and taught as a place that has never really contributed much to anything that has existed for a long time, sure, but where people are mainly just savages until they were civilized by colonialism and now all the countries have fallen apart and so on and so forth. I mean, you look at Northern Nigeria, which is just reported as like Boko Haram and people getting kidnapped, which is, has some of the, the richest history of the whole continent. I mean, some of the most uh, amazing things. You know, Kano, which will often be mentioned around Boko Haram, was one of the greatest dye pits in the history of antiquity uh, in terms of textile and clothing productions. And there's, there's so many different things that I could say. I mean, obviously Mali, Timbuktu, and the history of education and so on and so forth. But uh, you know, putting that in context, people not knowing that, people having such a negative view of the African continent. Naturally competitive, Europeans transitioned into the industrial era ahead of others, birthing their newfound dominance. Ask yourself, why were the British relentless about destroying all remnants of the great Benin wall and empire? What were they trying to hide? Why did North Africans burn down the great libraries of Timbuktu? What were they trying to hide? Needing free labor to power their economic systems, the transatlantic slave trade was born, alongside the creation of white supremacy. Figures like Henry the Navigator or Portugal's King Alfonso struggled to convince the Christian population to embrace black slavery. They devised propaganda to market their new product to the Portuguese, taking shape in influential literature, most notably the Chronicles of the Discovery and Conquest of Guinea, written by Gomez de Zarara. Thus, white supremacy and its relentless propaganda was born. In the past, pockets of power often existed across various regions of the world at the same time, sometimes leading to regional colonization. However, the technological advancements of the Industrial Revolution enabled the British to pioneer a new era of global unification and exploitation. Africans weren't the first slaves. Slavery has existed since the dawn of civilization. Moreover, during the 16th through 19th centuries, Europeans were notoriously also captured by North African Barbary pirates and forced to work in West African salt mines in Mali. The word slave originates from the Latin word sclavus, which refers to the Slavic people of Eastern Europe who are often forced into servitude. What made black people particularly suitable for post-feudal Europe and North America was our striking dark skin, which made us immediately distinguishable in Europe and the Americas. This in turn made escaping far more difficult. The transatlantic slave trade was a departure from the conventional form of slavery known to the world. It became a tool to fuel the transition from the feudal to the industrial era, requiring a massive workforce under chattel slavery, where the purchase of a slave also meant the enslavement of their descendants. 
This economic model incentivized the spread of anti-black propaganda and the creation of systemic structures designed to marginalize black populations, pushing them to the periphery of society. Associating black people with slavery is a persistent effort to devalue our worth and justify the ongoing re-traumatization of our people and culture. It's time we divorce ourselves from the status of slavery while never forgetting the brutal impact of white supremacy on black lives and their continued mission to oppress us. I want to go to President Biden. He sat up here with you, Charlemagne, and told black people that if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. So if you went out of your way begging black people to vote for you, why haven't we got an executive order or any other activity coming out of the Oval Office from President Biden to protect black people from police? I agree. Look what he's doing with the anti-Asian hate. President Joe Biden signed an executive order that is exclusive to Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. I don't have a problem with that. But if you can protect the Asian American and Pacific Islander from violence, why can't you do the same thing for black people? They've been dealing with violence for one year. Black people have been catching hell for 400 years. And we have yet to get an executive order from Joe Biden to protect us from the police. So can I ask you a question? If the Senate was able to pass the anti-Asian hate crimes bill, Charlemagne and Envy, 96 to 1, with almost no opposition, why is it that the Emmett Till lynching bill still has not been approved? Why is it that there have been over 200 different anti-lynching bills introduced in the U.S. Congress, 200, and not one of them has been approved by the U.S. Congress yet, but the first ever Asian bill goes through on the first try. Mm. Look at the racism. Look at the discrimination. Look at the bias. Look at the inequity there. While Europeans thrive during the industrial era, all things must come to an end. This is evident in Portugal's decline, once a pioneer in white supremacy and the slave trade. Today, its time has passed. The same is true for Great Britain. The most prolific imperialist nation has a dim future ahead. Since I've left office and I've traveled around Europe, I, I'm profoundly depressed. I just, nobody mentions the UK. We've just made ourselves irrelevant. And this is extraordinary. You know, the beginning part of this century, we were the we were the dominant force. France has effectively eclipsed that, and and we just you just don't hear a discussion of us. Britain has slumbered and stumbled its way through a number of setbacks. Three back-to-back -back geopolitical shockwaves have left it with a colossal debt: Brexit, COVID, and the Ukraine war. The catalyst, however, dates to 2008, when the financial crisis introduced long-lasting effects. Britain's economic chronicle, marked by a continuous decline, illustrates how one crisis triggers another and yet another, and ultimately leads to a chain of events from which there is no immediate relief. The UK is a miserable country and a bad place for young people to live. Meanwhile, productivity is low, one of the lowest of any major economy, and housing has become nearly unaffordable, with the UK holding the record for the highest number of homeless people in the developed world. British families are $10,000 worse off than the average German and Dutch family like. For added perspective, in 2007, the average British household was 8% less prosperous than those in Norway and just 6% behind those in the United States. In the years following, the deficit grew substantially. Today, British households sit 20% behind Norway and 16% behind the US in terms of real income. A lot of British people, they know that their life has got worse. They know that they're overtaxed. They know that they're not paid enough. They know that their cost of living has gone up. They know that their infrastructure has declined. But there's this apathy that comes with it at the same time that actually stops any progress. This small area makes up nearly half the UK's GDP while having about a third of its population. If one were to amputate London's output, it would reduce British living standards by 14%.
just enough to slip ahead of the US state of Mississippi. A lot of the towns in the UK, they really are just miserable, like deprived, all the shops closed, all the pubs have closed, which is meant to be a fundamental part of our culture, but pubs are just shutting down everywhere. Now, the crisis has become endemic with no quick fix in sight. When you think about it, it's ironic. The UK was the first country to industrialize. Now, it stands to become the first to de-industrialize. Germany is in recession. Revised figures for the first quarter show the German economy shrank by 0.3%. Moving on now, the Germans are unhappy. The economy is slowing down. The German Chancellor's ratings have plummeted to an all-time low. 52% of Germans think that their country is a declining power. Last year, it was the worst performing major economy in the world. The IMF predicts this will also happen in 2024. Germany has to choose its allies wisely in an increasingly divided world. And as it turns out, the nation doesn't have the military capabilities to defend itself or its allies. This makes the geopolitical headaches even worse. The country's international importance and its leadership role within the EU is now being called into question. And as if all this wasn't bad enough, Germany is also facing a population collapse. The sole entity saving Europe is America and its alliance in whiteness and the preservation of white supremacy. I think we've got 10 years. If we don't do it in 10 years, I think we're going to put our, essentially our kids in a position of extraordinary vulnerability for which they will not thank us. Although America isn't as homogeneously white as European nations, and most white Americans wouldn't be accepted as white in Europe, the US legally includes West Asians, Latinos, and North Africans in its definition of whiteness to inflate its numbers and importance yet keeps European descendants at the helm of its decision-making. This alliance is a political maneuver to maintain the white economic infrastructure. Whiteness can only survive as the majority. If divided, it is conquered. Nazi Germany learned the hard way that their vision of whiteness would have destroyed this economic infrastructure. Because the amount of white people in this country is shrinking. That's right. And whenever the amount of white people in America shrinks, America looks to find other white groups or other minority groups that they can build an alliance with to protect their power and their interests. Russia and China are crucial for global equilibrium, offering a multipolar world and accountability against European economic exploitation. As European economies continue to decline, the only thing holding them together is their legacy economic infrastructure and America's military might. Even though this force may be controlled by a black woman, it remains unclear if she will stray from her Western alliances. This is why Trump ironically could play a significant role.